Welcome everyone to Business and Life Stories with James and Mike. This week, our guest is Leah Zimmerman, who many of you have seen on LinkedIn. She does lots of cool videos on there interviewing people. She's the owner and founder of Stepping Stool Coaching. And her thing is called Acing Difficult Conversations. Mm -hmm. well, welcome, Leah. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, for coming on. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. So we, we've seen you work your magic in some of these interviews with people from all walks of life and, you know, some pretty big names in business. And there seems to be one common thing that I've heard you say is that reflection is super important. So can you go into that with us? And, and is that a foundational thing we need in order to build communication skills? Or is that something we add later? I'm always looking at what are people who are succeeding in a certain area of life doing. And then I also reflect on what has helped me be successful. And in doing that, I'd say reflection is one of the foundational things. And here's why. We hear people say that you need emotional awareness. Daniel Goleman in his book, on emotional intelligence or its primary leadership, I think when he talks about that, says the first thing is self-awareness. Then you can do self-management. When you have self-awareness and self-management, then you can start to manage others. You can become aware of others and then you can manage others. And it's that, those are the things that you need in, the, in that order. But how do you get self-awareness is the question I've been thinking of. People talk about self-awareness, but what is it that cultivates self-awareness? And I think it really comes back to a practice of reflection. And every leader that I talk to, when I'm asking questions, what they're doing is reflecting. And you can tell when they are people who have been reflecting already. Here's the thing mm -hmm. that I had learned. How did you learn it? Because I had a, you had to have some kind of reflection going on. But here's the other thing that I know is when you want to create change in your life, the thing you ask yourself, the questions you ask yourself to reflect upon need to change because the thing you're paying attention to, where your attention is going, is your perception. That's the lens that you're seeing your life. And then when you want to change that, you have the incredible power of reflection. And isn't it interesting that perception, lens, reflection, these are all about visuals. We see our life as if we're living through that movie. But mm. where power of reflection is we can shift the camera around and we can see how we lived in that scene from a different perspective. We're no longer in it. The perspective, these are all visual terminologies, the same that you might use for, for a movie or for the camera. So when you can look at yourself and say, well, what was I feeling? What did I really want? What was it that I really needed? How else would I like this to go? What else would I want this to be different? And so that is the power of reflection. When I think back to, well, how did I get to be so good at conversations? One, I'm incredibly curious about people. So I'm always having them and I'm always asking. But two, I had a lot of conversations that I didn't like. And I would say, how, what can I do to make this better? And I'll tell you a story that went back to that. My husband, who was my, maybe my boyfriend, maybe uh, early years of being married at the time, came to my family Friday night dinner. We, we leave the city. We go to my family Friday night Shabbat dinner. And I had this pattern. My dad would ask questions. I'd start talking or I might, I would share a new perspective, a new point of view I was learning from school. And my dad would argue with me. And at the end, I'd feel awful because I never felt validated. I never felt heard. And my husband said to me, you know, if you don't feel good in that conversation, you don't have to have it. It never occurred to me. I didn't have to participate in this pattern. This was how my dad and I had a relationship. Mm -hmm. And my husband had a different perspective, a different reflective question. Well, what do I want to do different? I, if I feel bad, I don't have to do it. So what do I want to do next time? Well, next time when that happens, I don't have to argue back. I don't have to prove anything. And when I realized that, it started to change the relationship. And I started to try that out elsewhere. My grandmother also used to love to give me advice and tell me that I had nothing. If I stop having anything to prove or if I start reflecting on what didn't felt uncomfortable, this moment in the conversation is when I felt uncomfortable. Well, what do I, can I do different? There's a lot we can't change in the other people, but we can change so much in ourselves. 
and how we change the conversation. So reflection for me was the tool that helped me start to find these little bit of spaces and conversations so that I could have better relationships and be more comfortable in these conversations and with family. It's what I would go back to at the end of the day as a teacher. Where was the part that was really hard? Where's the moment with this child when I might have been better at the behavior management or asked a better question that would have elicited better learning? And that is what helped me accelerate growth and learning faster. And then I'd find partners for reflection. And I'd say all the growth that I've had is because I found good coaches who helped me reflect and ask different questions and perceive, therefore notice things differently, therefore have different reflections, therefore have new, new questions. So the foundational thing I think is reflection because from reflection, you can start to build that self-awareness, what I was feeling in the moment. That's where you can start to change how you showed up, that self-management. And then when you show up the way you want to show up and you're not so self-conscious anymore, you can start to pay attention and you notice more things in others. When you become more aware of yourself, you have a newer and richer vocabulary for understanding things in others. And then you do that, you start to be able to know how to manage them a lot better. And that's the leadership, that's the emotional intelligence. And that is a very long-winded way of telling you why I think reflection is the foundational piece for all of that. I've never heard anyone put it the way you just put it. And so all the books and seminars and things on emotional intelligence and it just, it always rang a little bit not applicable to me in terms of how do I actually implement or non implementable, right. I should say. I was picking up on that. So now that I'm in this sphere and I'm watching other people's videos and reading other people's things, I'm like, well, people talk about self-awareness, but that doesn't answer the question of, well, how do I become more self-aware? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then how do I do that? Get a good coach is 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 a good one. But the, well, a lot of coaches, what the thing will do is tell you are reflective things. So positive psychology, the field of psychology has shown that if you write three things that you're grateful for every morning, this will start to change your affect because you will start to have gratitude is a positive affect that will range. This will, um, uh, what am I say? Rise. What's the other this will raise. That's the raise. word. Raise. will raise your mood or your vibration, depending what language you use out there. Gratitude will do that. And you start writing it every day. And in order to do that, it's a reflective practice to write down what you're grateful for. What will that do? That will change your perceptive of things you're grateful for. It will change your mood. Another one that is proven to has science behind it is three things that went well at the end of the day. Write down the three big wins you had, the three things you did, and go through the motions of how you made those happen. This is a reflective practice. And that is where the research shows that this can cr create better mood. And you can also start to change what you want to do by putting your focus and your attention. So I sort of taken what I've read about attention and learned about attention through mindfulness. And I really like Ami Jha's, um, Ami Jha's book on peak mind. Take that and put that with some of these positive psychology things. And there are all a lot of people to read, you know, on that. You, Martin Settleman, Barbara Fredrickson, and then put that with some of the emotional intelligence things. And you start to see, oh, that's how it works together. Mm. And that's and that's what you get to do when you're a coach and you love all that kind of stuff. Read it, digest it, synthesize it so that you can put it into action for your clients and share it out with other people. When a manager or company founder, it's most of our audience, and I've had this experience myself, so I'm a I'm prime example. When I'm speaking to someone else, what's a way that I can sense whether or not they feel like they're being heard? Mm, that's a great question. What do you think? I have learned just to ask, particularly if it's someone from a different culture, different gender, something very different than me. I ask, are you hearing what I'm saying? T tell me back what what you're hearing. And also, do you think I'm hearing you? Mm -hmm. This is what I think I heard you say. Is that what you meant? Yeah. So you just did two things there. One is 
how you check if you've been heard, and the other is how you signal to someone else that they've been heard. Yeah, but I'm wondering if that's the best way to do it or if that even works, because I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I think all of that is subjective. I don't know right. that there's anything that can say, this is the way you help somebody feel heard. <laughs> but I think it really goes back to attention. Is your attention on the other person? Can they feel that your attention is on them? Mm -hmm. And how do you signal to them that your attention is on them? Are they sustaining eye contact with you? Are you sustaining eye contact? Are you nodding? Are you mm -hmm along the way? I can feel when someone's doing that because I'll end up keep talking. I'm from New York. If someone doesn't interrupt, I don't always know where to stop. In New York, we signal that we're paying attention. We overlap each other's sentences. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, I've got family in New York. And that's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's really funny. Yeah. So there's different speech patterns that also have to do with some of these cultural things that we do to show how we're listening. And in New York, one of those things, and especially in that Northeast Jewish uh, dialect, which is, doesn't mean you have to be Jewish to be in it, but it's a common thing in the air region is to overlap, like in Woody Allen movies. That doesn't mean you're not hearing the other person. You're hearing. But there's a way you're hearing and saying, I hear you and I raise you. <laughs> I hear you and I add. <laughs> um, so it's different levels of hearing and being with people. So we have different ways of signaling that we're paying attention. And we have different things that we want. But does that mean that we've heard people and we've understood their intentions? So saying back to somebody, it sounds like, and or did I get that right? And it depends on the kind of conversation, how casual it is, how formal it is. With, with clients, I'll say things back and then I'll ask, is that right? Because I'm often saying it back with a little bit of what I understand. I'm, I'm shifting the language around it a little bit to help articulate more of what I think the essence of what they're trying to say is. But I always say, is that am I right? I, I don't want to presume to put words in people's mouth. So I always want to know where they are. But another thing that we do is just acknowledge. We can acknowledge, oh yeah, you're saying, you're saying this could be really difficult. Ah, I hear you. And those those are ways that we acknowledge in conversation too, to put those signals out. Yeah, I'm hearing you. I'm listening. But it's about attention. If our attention's fully on the other person, they'll sense it. And then it's about signaling. What we tend to do in our is put our attention on what our next thought's going to be. Are we ready with the next thought? Are we ready to defend the ego? Are we ready to prove what we know? And that is the big um, thing that can get in the way of effective communication. This is what I've seen happen so many times in business. We have a great idea. We've got a tech team working on it. Things are going and some non-technical overlord comes in. And all of a sudden the contributors with the idea stop talking. They're not being heard. They know they're not being heard, so they don't say anything else. So what is an, uh, a way that a more introverted, more shy type personality that really has something genuine to contribute to the conversation can have that, can turn that, can, can sort of do uh, verbal judo in that difficult, that difficult overlord figure and get them to listen? So I'll, I'll share a couple strategies, but I actually have to credit David Siegel. When I interviewed him, I asked him this question because I'd seen somebody else asking it and wanted to have more of an elaborate answer. It, it, the, I don't entirely know the context that you're describing, but I think what you're saying is that somebody comes in with a stronger, more dominant personality, and then the people who actually know and have content start yes. to be quieter because they don't want to speak up against someone who maybe has more authority, has a stronger personality, and their expertise is the tech. In that situation, the suggestion I would make is not do it in the group and in the moment. Mm. Depending on who you are, you want to find another moment to say, I heard you say this. I appreciate that. Make sure the per you get, you can show this is what you're trying to tell us. It sound this is what you want to make happen. Are you interested in an alternative approach? Are you interested in what my expertise? And ask the question. And even if you need to do it in, in the moment, do it through a question first. Because most of the time, a question opens a loop in someone's brain, and now they're curious. 
and you've gotten permission, may I ask a question? So when you get the permission and you make it a question, you now have somebody, you've given the clues, the cues somebody needs to shift their attention, to, to agree that, yes, I want to listen to you and to hear a question. And a question is non-threatening. And then they'll usually peak curiosity. When you peak curiosity and open that loop in the brain, the brain wants to finish it. So now they want to hear what you have to say. That's such a great technique um, because the story I'm talking about, and I, I don't want to use names, um, but we were working, we were working on the working on the space shuttle program, and we had this big high mucky muck manager come in. What my mentor actually said, and I was sitting in the chair next to him, so I made the mistake of laughing because I found this hilarious. He said, so you obviously aren't interested in listening to anything we have to say, but what are you going to do when that rocket blows up? Yeah, <laughs> well, this I think isn't that, the kind I, of question that you're not, you're not talking thing. about that. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I think back to my own situations uh, in, you know, life and death was not at stake, but the board I worked for wanted to cut money. And I would tell them why it was a good idea or not a good idea. In some ways I was too comfortable speaking and that did not necessarily mean they actually got the message. Mm. Sometimes the better way to get the message is what's the common goal? Okay, I think we're all here to talk about how we can get this rocket ship to go do this thing. I think we're gonna talk about how we get these programs, engage more people and do it within our budget. Is that right? Make sure you everyone knows that you are have your eyes on the same horizon. Oh, then, wow. then when you have your eyes on the same horizon, you are standing more shoulder to shoulder instead of adversarial. Okay, well, I hear your idea about how you think we'll get there, that if we just cut this part of the budget, we'll reach that. I think there'll be other consequences to that that are not in line with our overall goal. Would you like to hear how I see it? And I, you know, very few people would say no. And if they say no, it's a big clue to you about who you're working for <laughs> and, and yeah. where you are. Oh, wow. That's some, that's some really great techniques. I wish they taught us this stuff in school. Right. <laughs> it seems like this ought to start really in grade school and start learning these things. Oh, if you get me started one day, the TED Talk I do is going to be the things you need to unlearn from school. Because what we learn in school is to put more value on external approval yes. and disapproval. Yes. What we learn in school is you sh correct people to help something get better, is that you put people down or you humiliate them to gain control, is we learn to please because we're children and we just want to succeed. Right. So whether it's the parents or the teachers, we're going to adapt ourselves to fit the environment we're in. But it's the opposite of what you need to become an autonomous adult who feels like you have agency in the world. You need to start to know how you can use your voice to create things, how you use your voice to win people over, how you have conversations to create bridges with other people. And that's something as parents that we can do and as teachers that we can do. We can help children learn how to speak up. You don't like the school policy. So how might you let how might you talk about that with the principal? How might you talk about that with your teacher in a way that they can listen and hear you? And some of those techniques that I shared are some of the same ones. And you can bet my kids have practiced them. Uh, in younger grades, then not as much in high school. In high school, hey mama, it's not gonna not gonna matter. When I'm not here anymore and they can't retaliate, the fear of retaliation. Oh yeah. Well you can keep them quiet and not saying anything, even when they right. have an opinion. Uh, and, and particularly a lot of males carry that high school intimidation game into business and management. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It never helps a company to run that way. It doesn't. I think of it in stages of development. It makes it a lot easier for me. We can't expect a two-year-old to do what a six-year-old can do. You know, my background does come from education. And a lot of my insights also come from what I had to learn to manage a classroom without being control and command. Because well, I wanted to do it from the bottom up. I wanted to know how to empower and support children to succeed, not how to come at them from uh, you have to do this kind of a style. And we can't expect someone who's younger, and we can see that because they look so different 
We don't expect yes. a five-year-old to do what a 17-year-old can do. But we have stages of development in leadership also. Some of us choose to develop. Some of us don't realize there's anywhere to go or we think fine where we are. Someone who's in the command and control stage of leadership only knows and sees the world through this lens of you're either in charge or you're the one who's in charge, you're being, who's absurdian. I either show that I have authority or somebody else will come and show they have authority over me. And it's not invalid. It's just only one way of being. And if you want to grow from there, you can, because there are going to be whole other ways of being that will motivate your team, get them even, to go even farther and help create new possibilities. But command and control is going to limit what you can do as a leader. If you want to really, in our world, you have a changing landscape of what's possible all the time. And we are trying to create new technologies and new solutions to problems. You need to be able to listen and ask questions that make people feel they can speak from a place that's creative. A place that's creative needs to be in a place that's not going to be judged or edited. We cannot be creative and judgmental at the same time. We can't be curious and judging at the same time. We can't be cre we can't create and edit at the same time. So when there's a leader who comes in with editing about what could be wrong, we have to correct and we have to fix. It's going to affect how people show up. If you can grow to a place of leadership where you know how to invite invention and curiosity, but still hold a rigorous standard, still hold people to certain behavioral standards you can see a whole lot more success and you can raise people up. But I prefer to think of it as not this is good, this is bad. This is just different ways of being. Most of way more historically in our society, we have been command and control. And we've seen many, many more models of command and control. So oh, yeah. it makes sense. That's where people are and that's where they're stuck. And at some reflection, they could say, do I want it to be different? Do I want to get more out of my people? How might I want to do that? And if someone's in that place, then they've opened the door to be able to discover new possibilities and how to lead. And then there's plenty of leadership coaches that you can find who will help you to grow in that and everyone with a little bit of a different way. So, and what you just said is why. It's one of the primary reasons. I've been studying this for 30 plus years. It's one of the primary reasons most startup companies fail within the first three years out of business. And that's because Plus, we have the command and control. It's one of the primary because of that resistance to letting go of the command and control model. Yeah. Um, we have a saying here in Texas that I, I grew up with. That I've always loved it because it's so true. And I don't know wh where they got this, but it's like, you can tell me what to do or you can tell me how to do it. If you tell mm -hmm. me both, if you tell me both, nothing good is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In the context of Texas, I could take that on from my yeah. years when I taught kindergarten, but I'm not going to go there right now. I, I'd say that listening to what you're saying about how they people fail from command and control, because yeah, there are some places where command and control works. Like you need it under pressure if you are in a life and death situation. And they yes. use it in the armed services to a certain extent. But yep. It's not going to help with innovation. It's also, it's fear-driven. Command and control is fear-driven, which is why it takes a kind of evolution. If we're in a fear state, we operate differently. And it's really a shifting of a brain state and a shifting of a way, an, a sort of different en energy to, and to step into, emotional energy to step into, to be able to have more faith that if you listen and slow down and don't have certainty, and don't have control that you can actually still navigate. And that's counterintuitive for most people. It's and it very, is it's hard. The best tactician I ever met was Sergeant Jimmy Hill in the Marines. And he used to look at the officers when we get orders and he'd just say, well, I understand you want this done, correct? Yeah, okay, and make sure I understood what you said. How creative can we be? That's just the technique that I described to you. You yeah, already knew it. Right. See, here's yeah, the, just, here's the horizon. Know that's what it was. <laughs> we put it on the horizon. This is where we want to go. And now I'm going to ask a question because now I'm going to provoke the thinking. I'm going to see if you are open to shifting the thinking. Questions 
are the best way to do that. And the only thing I added is the permission. So can I ask you a question? Or can I ask you a little bit of a diff difficult question or change in there? But but that's but that's kind of it. If you think of it as, um, I, I think sometimes we have to think of control more like the sailboat or the surfer. Mm. Because you can't control the waves. And you try and tell the waves how to obey you so that your surf will work. <laughs> it's not going to work. You're going to go on. The same thing if you're sailing and you're going to try to dictate to the wind what to do. But if you are, if you're growing your sailing skills and you're growing your surfing skills, you go with what is in the moment. And that's what builds your confidence. And that's the same in conversations and leadership. The confidence in becoming conversation ace comes from knowing that in any moment, I'll have some maneuverability and I'll know how to shift if somebody gets upset, if a conflict comes up, because I'm going to be present with it and I'm going to trust my own resourcefulness. Instead of having to trust that I have control and that I'm telling the wind or the ocean what to do, I'm going to trust that I have the resourcefulness and the tools to move with the elements that I can't control. And that's what's going to help me move forward in my direction. And so that helps you um, sort of not get caught up in the fear right. of conflict, right? It helps you just let that subside from your mind so that you can proceed in the conversation. Yeah. And so by realizing that um, you can't, if you're trying to control the fear, then that's what's coming into the conversation. If you're trying to control the outcome, that's what's coming into the conversation. Mm. But if you are open to the winds, to the ocean, trusting that you have the resourcefulness to navigate it, you've now opened way more possibility and the conversation can go in a whole other set of directions that you never realized. And new things will show up, but it's also how you're showing up because why I say it's never what you're saying or how you say it. So I can share strategies and tactics. But it all comes down to who you're being. Are you being someone who's trying to be in control? Because that's what the other person's going to see. Are you being someone who's afraid? That's what the other person's going to see. When a child rebels against something their parent tells them, it's because who that parent is when they tell them what to do. It's who they're being. I'm being the one who knows. I'm being the afraid for you. I'm being the one who's trying to control. And the mm -hmm. child has to find their own agency. And where they can find agency is to rebel. Same thing can happen on your staff. So it's who you're being. If you're being someone who's open, you're going to have a whole diff big difference. It's the difference between this, you show up with a clenched fist, whether you're clenching it from fear, oh my God, this better go the way I want, or it's clenching it from, oh, you better do what I want it to do. This is clenched. That's what people see. You can see how my energy shifts. Yes. What a difference it is if you show up with an open hand and you show up like this. So in essence, it's really about what's behind and underneath the way our body language will show up. Are we this? Okay. I'm listening. Am I listening? What's this really saying about who I'm being and how I'm showing up to this conversation as opposed to what this says about who I'm being and how I show up to this conversation? And these are the things where really our other people's brains are actually really processing, not just the words or how we say them but who this other person in the conversation is being and who they think I am in position and relative to them. They think I'm subservient. They think they're up. They're trying to be one up on me. I'm going to respond from that. They are trying to support me to succeed. Well, then I'm going to respond from that. So that's the, the, the more that's, that's the part we really can control. And that's how we control the ocean and the waves. It's by knowing how we're going to show up. And we show up with an energy that can be much more expansive than just the person who's trying to control the sails on the rudder. Wow, that's so brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, James, I think he's got his microphone working. Do you have some questions? Is it that? working? Is it yeah, working? Oh, it is. Great. There we go. Um, I've, I've been frantically kind of noting and or trying to absorb everything and for me it just ties in so many things and i feel that this conversation has been wonderful because it's actually gone from a coaching dynamic 
all the way to uh, difficult conversations, which is obviously where your speciality lies. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, what I really picked up on was that by having a self-reflective practice, be that through uh, working with a coach, or as you said, just very simple things like writing down uh, three things we are uh, grateful for. For a self-reflective practice to occur, one has to develop being present. Mm. And it develops being it develops being present. But being present then develops presence. And by developing presence, we then we that that presence is that higher vibration, isn't it? It's like when we walk in a room, we can all feel it. We can just sense it. Right. And we can sense it when we have those conversations. So we rise, we we we, we have we nurture, we culture a presence. And I feel that by culturing presence, by being having a practice of being present so we can self reflect. It gives us that quiet confidence, doesn't it? That we can go out to the sea and we have that presence that um, I'm sure there's phrase, there's uh, phrases where people can feel the wind or taste the wind or, or there is all of those analogies in so many sports uh, and pastimes. And it could be intuition, although intuition is all almost transgenerational and kind of a bit more esoteric, but it verges into that intuition. So if we know that we can cultivate this presence and we're able to focus our minds to be present during a conversation, then rather than being reactive, as in, I don't agree with that, we can go, ah, so I'm listening to the conversation and I'm reflecting on it as it's going along. So maybe yeah. I could ask this question, which would be so much more beneficial than going, I don't agree with that. So <laughs> if I was to summarize, is that something which really we can all cultivate that? What I guess I've tried to not to um, distill this wonderful conversation into maybe a series of very simplistic steps. But I, but I'm wondering, are we sort of on the right track here of during um, business conversations, if we can just develop having the confidence of being present, and then it just enables us to hear between yeah. the words. And so we Absolutely. can ask those questions, which opens up a parallel dimension of opportunities rather than just putting up a, a, a brick wall of, I don't agree with this. Yes. Well, there are a number of things in what you said. I don't think, I think you don't have to be learn, learn how to cultivate presence in terms of being present in the conversation in order to be self-reflective. Self-reflection will help you re recognize how present or present you were in. Therefore, how present do you want to be the next time? There are other tools that help you develop how to be present in the moment. Um, and then I think it's not so linear, the presence, which is really about where your attention is. So learning how to manage your attention to be in the moment, not just on the things you're saying, but also helps you manage your attention to go understand those emotions that are coming up. So our reactions often come from the emotions. So in order to stay present and not reactive also means we have to start to become present and attentive to ourselves and our emotional state without letting the that come through us. It's actually the opposite in acting, and which is so interesting because that's part of how I sort of develop my, my ideas about these things, is that in acting, what I had to learn to do was allow those emotions to speak through and be reactive, which is what I didn't want to do at home in my life. I wanted harmony, so I would approach a scene and not want to do that because that's not how I wanted people to be but actually that's what creates drama so it's what I have to do <laughs> right so I had to become aware of, uh, and some of the way that my teacher cultivated that was by having us be so present and slow down so much in a scene 
that we could become really aware of what the emotions are that are going on. And I coach some actors sometimes, and that's what I do, slow them down. And when you slow down enough, and this is what you can do in reflection, is you can go back to, go back to that moment in the conversation. And that moment when I said that, okay, what was, what's that feeling? When he said that to me, what did I, and you allow that emotion to speak, now you have more information. Now you kind of know where that reaction was coming from and you have new insight into what was really going on for you. But we do have this, it, it is this tension between react and respond. Do you allow that space like Viktor Frankl talks about between the stimulus and the response? So you can choose your response. In order to do that, you have to be able to know how to put your attention there. But that's a big tall order for a lot of us who haven't trained our attention. So then the reflection mm -hmm. allows you to go back and now put your attention in it when you might not have been do it, able to do it in that moment. So as much as I've spent time thinking about this, I have a human being and I have my moments of complete losing my shit. It's always my husband <laughs> and it's always at home. And I can hear it, but it happens that I have still have what I call those emotional landmines, something that can get triggered and can explode. And in the moment, ooh, I can be fierce. But the second we're out of it, all of us, I'll feel what I'm really feeling. What was really going on? Or it might take a little bit of a walk. And then it's the reflection that goes, well, I think this is what was happening for me. I think that's what was really going on. Okay, so what do we want to do next time? When I feel that way next time, how can I be proactive? How can I be ahead of it? Because I was not present in that conversation. <laughs> But the self-reflection helps me to be able to revisit it with presence so that I can find a new way to be responsive. And I think it's that practice that can help us to grow how to be present, although I think there are other attention um, things we need to do to, to become more mindful of our attention and know how to maneuver it and feel more in control of it. But that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, that there are moments where we're just not going to be fully present, where we're going to be reactive. But we always have... Uh, a chance to revisit, to travel to the past through mm -hmm. our reflection and to be with it in that moment and to be with our discomfort and the uncertainty and the emotional explosion and investigate with curiosity what was going on. What we tend to do is berate ourselves. I can't believe I did that. Oh my God, I can't believe I said that to this child. I'm uh, For me, being a teacher was where I met myself and it was this goal to be a better and better teacher who could be really so kind and yet still so powerful in the classroom that was where my mind was going and oh i didn't do this well enough and i don't do that but that's not helpful you know, we can do that as leaders i should have said this i should have said that how could they do this how could they do that what's helpful is to go oh yeah i got really pissed wow man i really lost my shit. or oh, man i was a little harsh what can i what can i be in now in the moment of accepting that that's how i was and now what can I reflect on what I want to do different or how I want to repair this relationship? And that's where I actually get more control because we're going to be human. Yes. We're, we're all going to say stuff we shouldn't say. So um, do you have a preferred way for listeners to contact you? Should that be through LinkedIn or do you have another? My favorite is LinkedIn. LinkedIn, um, okay. And the other is to just text me. I have a text number for business. If it's from this, from here, I'll give you the number. You can just text and tell me where you heard me. And anyone who's listening to me and wants, I have a, a guide that takes you through some of this reflection for difficult conversations. So when you're preparing for a difficult conversation, I have a guide for that. And if you're interested in that, then you just let me know you heard me here or you just put in there. Uh, oh, shoot, I didn't double check the, my name of it right now, but it's the guide for difficult conversations. Just put that in there. And if I get a text that says that, I just, I send, um, I get, I, I'll ask your email, I'll send it to you. And that does not necessarily mean that I put you on my subscriber list all of a sudden, blah, blah, blah. It just means I'm happy to hear from you. I'm happy to share something. And it's nice to have a conversation. And I mostly prefer to just start chats with people. So I would share my number so I can give it to you for anyone who's listening. And then you yep. can put it in the notes for anyone who wants to write something. 909-833-0978. 909-833-0978. And if you send me anything inappropriate, I will block you. 
Most people don't do that. <laughs> people use the number responsibly. And, and then I'm very happy to share a guide that I've created or some, you know, depending what, what people need, what difficult conversation they're facing, what they're trying to do for themselves. I have some different kinds of materials and things I'm happy to share. Well, and that's I, really a nice offer. Very wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm also very happy to answer people's questions and just be available for small little questions. It's very hard for someone to come forward and say, Leah, I heard you. I have a difficult conversation coming up and now I want to bear my soul and share all my vulnerability <laughs> with you. And 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 so you can really help me. And, and that's just not really going to work. It's, it's really <laughs> going in just little ways to feel safe and comfortable and build, you know, little guides and skills and conversations. And that's how it starts. That's how we start making change. Well, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate your time. Thank you thank so you much. Me. Thank you so James much. And I, uh, James and I and our listeners all just went to conversation school. So. <laughs> conversation <laughs> University. Well, it's uh, it was a pleasure. You were really listening and picking up on things that are my strengths and my area. I was really happy to talk about and want to share with people because I really do believe that we can have better conversations. And when we have better conversations, we have better relationships, we have better businesses, and ultimately we will have a better world. So that is